Welcome to episode 41 of the Midwest Angler Podcast. I'm Scott Sturman, and I'm joined as always by Matt Deitch. Matt, I finally got my first win in a bass tournament. Finally got your first win in a bass tournament. And not to take away the season that you've been having, I mean, you've already had a second place, but you finally got that that W. Yeah, I could, that I could, dub, I, could, dub, I, could give, I could give away the, uh, the money that I won. I could whatever, just that little, you know, and, and it's nothing. It's not a big trophy. It's, it's a little piece of wood that says first play or, you know, tournament champion, whatever, but, like, but that's all I've been wanting. When, when I got my first one this year too, I mean, I, I brought that thing over here that time, you know, yeah. you, you're proud of that. I mean, you put, right. in, you put the work into it and the time and the commitment to it. And it's, you definitely got to be happy about it. Yep. Well, we'll talk later uh, later on in the episode about the tournament, but uh, first we've got a really cool uh, uh, guest today, Dan Hogue, owner of Cold Snap Outdoors. Uh, they're the makers of the uh, super popular toothpick and, and the auger covers that uh, you just go on, you know, you slam them in there and boom, they, they snap on, I guess, cold snap, right? That's right. But uh, yeah, no, we'll uh, get right over to him. Hey, Dan, are you there? Yes, I am. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, for those of you listening, uh, Dan is the owner of Cold Snap Outdoors. Uh, they're the makers of the popular uh, toothpick and, and the auger covers, and they're, they've also got a few other products. Um, Dan, where did you grow up, and how did you get into fishing? Well, I grew up in uh, Minnesota, south of Albert Lee, in between Albert Lee and the Iowa border. So um, grew up there back in the 70s and 80s, and I uh, went fishing with my dad and my cousins and just kind of fell in love with it then. You bet. Now, uh, the cold snap, uh, tell us, how, how did you, uh, how did that all start? You know, obviously, like I said, you're most famous for the auger cover and the toothpicks, but, you know, what idea triggered it? You know, there's got to be some sort of story that goes along with that. Yeah, well, it's actually kind of an interesting story, and, um, you, you hear people talk about inspiration and 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 you know how other people have done something that it gives you um, hey maybe I could do that someday well and I guess that person for us might have been Dave Gens and um, my cousin Mark and I were riding in the truck to go fishing it was on a normal weekend and we were lamenting the fact that we'd have to go back to work on Monday and and said boy it'd be nice if we could just fish all the time like Dave. And uh, my cousin Mark said, I was thinking about it, this, you know, how an auger cover, you got to put that strap on it. You know, think about it if you just had something that just snapped on where you didn't have to bend over and, and uh, put the strap on and get your hands down by the blades. And I said, wow, that's a great idea. And uh, we never really talked about it anymore that day, and, but it just kind of stuck in the back of my head. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, I, I just couldn't shake it. And... So I ended up going to Shields and buying a, an, another cover and using duct tape and some cardboard. And I started trying to fashion something like how I thought it might work. And, and then that led to a phone call with a patent attorney. And they put us in touch with the right people. And, you know, I just kind of kept following the steps along the way, figuring eventually if maybe something wouldn't work out. And, you know, but it just turned out that, we do one step and it lead to something else, and we do another step and it led to something else, and design changes and everything, and here we are, you know, probably 18 years later. Uh, you know, that was late and late in the year in 2002. Really, I didn't realize that Cold Snap had been around right, that yeah, long. That yeah, like it's a 18 year overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the other thing. I talked to Dave. I don't know probably five, six years ago at the Thorn Brothers portable modification get-together, and I was standing amongst all the clam fish houses and talking to him, and I said, Dave, did you ever think it would get like this and see, you know, be standing here among all these these uh, fish houses and it all started from one that you made? You know, and he said, well, yeah. I just didn't think it was going to take so long. <laughs> I thought I mean, that's a great answer, and I feel you know the same way. I know when we first had the idea for the cover, I'm like, "Hey, this is going to be great. Everybody will want one, you know, and and we'll sell hundreds of thousands of them." And and uh, you know, you go into it with the idea that uh, you have a great idea, but if it, it takes a long time for people to 
see it, hear about it, you know. It, it's you, it, you have you don't everybody underestimates the marketing side of it to tell you the truth. Yeah, I, yeah. I believe that. Yeah. So yeah. so now like le- the last few years it seems like there's been a boom in a lot of different auger companies coming out with new augers. Do you guys like when a new one comes out? Do you guys how do you get your hands on one to kind of fit one for that an auger cover for that, or are they all pretty universal? Well, that's a good that's a good point. Um, sometimes we're able to. Well, we usually find out about it from insider sources. You know, hey, there's going to be a new auger coming out, and we'll maybe get a grainy picture of it from a catalog that hasn't been printed yet. Uh, that sometimes happens, or, you know, just like the, the light flight, you know, I heard about it months back and, and was told that it was going to be like the previous synthetic, uh, bit that was on the bottom. And it turned out that's what it was. But until we saw one for sure, we, you know, we weren't, we weren't going to spend the time trying to design something for it yet. But, um, you know, it's just each, the, the, the issue with the auger cover business is that, um, every size and brand has a specific different mold that needs to be made. So um, we're constantly chasing the new ones that we think are going to be successful and will sell a lot. So this year we're actually um, got some big announcements around some some sizes and some other brands that are coming out uh, that uh, we'll, we'll be able to release to you here in a few more weeks. But uh, some that people have been waiting for for quite a while. And um, I guess I would even say that we're working on the pistol bit. Like, it's my full intention to have that 8-inch pistol bit on the market here um, early in the winter. So um, the mold is in production and just in the final stages. So, so yeah, the pistol bit was new last year, so it's taken us a little bit of time. But we kind of wanted to see how it was received in the market first. Yeah, absolutely. You can't go and make, you know, thousands of covers when, when if, if the auger itself dies and doesn't get popular. Exactly. And I think, you know, there's quite a few of them on the market. And, and we can judge during the season, too. Just people will send emails or a phone call saying, hey, do you have this auger cover yet? And we did get a lot of calls for the pistol bit. So, yeah. Right on. Now, now you're not an engineer, uh did you hire a company somewhere to, to engineer this up after you had made your original prototype? And how did you go about the whole entire manufacturing process? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a probably a longer question than our, our podcast would allow for. But in a <laughs> nutshell, there is a place through the South Dakota State University that will help inventors bring their product to market um, where they can do for you know nominal fees um, they'll do patent searches. They'll help you um, get in touch with, um, you know, in the beginning stages, getting in touch with draftsmen that can help draft your uh, model. They can get you in touch with people who can do 3D prototypes. And they're all people who have agreed to work with uh, the university and do things at a, you know, at a reasonable cost that the university, you know, deems as being credible and good people to work with. And then even past that, they'll even introduce you to what they would call angel investors, which, um, right. uh, for lack of a better term, is a venture capitalist who might help you bring in your product to market and and um, get you the financing you'd need to do it, uh, you know, on a big scale. Right. Um, so, yeah, the, there's different steps you take. They're great about helping walk you through the steps. It's called the South Dakota Enterprise Institute. Um, and yeah, it's, it, that's what we, we were really one of the first products to come out of there. And that's been, I don't know, 15 years or eight, 16 years ago, maybe even more. So yeah, so that we're, we're kind of an early success story for them. And so where, where did you end up finding the, the plastic manufacturing? Well, that's actually done right here in the Midwest as well. Um, you know, some of it's done in Aberdeen, South Dakota, <clears throat> and a bunch more of it's done in Iowa, just outside of Orange City. So, oh, um, yeah. So, you know, I, uh, I think I'm trying to think of the name of the town. I, I should have wrote it down ahead of time, but it's the very first city to the east of Orange City. Yeah, Hospers. No, but it's even littler. It's like, I, it's not Elbert, but it's something. It's probably like Alton. 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 There you go. Alton. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking where we go to have 
uh, smoked ribs. <laughs> <laughs> It's dinner time here. Yeah, don't don't get Scott talking about smoked ribs yeah. because that'll be a whole. We don't have enough time for a podcast for that one. I'm out of here. <laughs> His stomach's growling. Yeah. So then, you know, besides the auger cover, you guys have the toothpick. I mean, that's probably one of my favorite things to use. I the winter, I always have it hooked onto my jacket or my bibs. During the summer, it's always in my boat because I mean, we use it a lot. How did you guys come up with the concept for that? Well, that's a that's another good story. Um, you know, we we have pro staffers, and um, it's basically an adaptation from a something that was already in use but is no longer on the market anymore. Um, so we basically changed the design, and and uh, I added to it, um, and was able to get a patent on it. So yeah, so it was um, from Todd Todd, which is where the T two comes from, and the T two toothpick. Okay. Um, I told the guys, hey, if you ever get a product together and it makes sense and we can market it, I'll name it after you. So that's where the T2 toothpick came from was that T2 is Todd Todd uh, from over in Illinois. He's a longtime pro staffer for us. I was I was thinking that it was like that, that you came out with a T1 at one point and this was the T2, like the second <laughs> version. You came up with something that made a little bit more sense or worked a little bit better. But no, Todd Todd, that's that's very cool. Nope, yeah, it's from Todd Todd, and if you look at the packaging, a bunch of the packaging has his face on the back. It doesn't tell the story on there, but he's in the advertising as well. Very cool. Now, one of the things I was kind of wondering here when I'm thinking about, you know, plastic that's out on the ice all the time, you know, plastic becomes real brittle when it gets out in the cold. Do you have a special kind of plastic? Is there a special uh, deal in the manufacturing that... Because, I mean, obviously when somebody's slamming their auger into a, into a plastic device, a lot of times it would get brittle and break. You know, you obviously don't have that problem. Yeah, and that, there was a, there's all different kinds of plastics. Uh, that's, I mean, it's basically you'd have to have a chemistry major and then have a specialty in plastics to go over all the different types. But the, what, what it is, it's a different copolymer, so it's not your standard plastic that your kids' toys are made out of, for sure. Uh, it comes in great big boxes that are four feet by four feet by four feet in pellet form. Um, and um, it's all injection molded. Uh, you know, one of the stories we heard, and we've sold auger covers to Strike Master for a number of years now, and one of the stories we heard was during their uh, pro staff days, they had put one of our covers in the freezer overnight and then hit it with a six pound hammer on the stage in front of everybody and it bounced in the air and came down in one piece so uh it it it, it's been tested for years now it is plastic so if you abuse it enough you sure could break it if you tried but under normal situations you'll never break it if it falls off your truck tailgate going 75 across the ice and it and it hits a chunk of ice sticking up, will it break? Yeah, I'm sure you, you can break it. But um, it's lifetime guaranteed, and we wouldn't make that uh, guarantee if uh, we had to replace them all the time. And do we ever get one? Occasionally we'll get one returned, but um, not enough of them to even quibble over. I mean, it's very minimal out of the thousands and thousands that we sell. We hardly ever have one come back broken. Well, and, and the price point of your products, you know, I mean, it'd be different if somebody was spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars and, and something like that broke. But the price point that you're at, you know, along with people just knowing plastic isn't concrete, you know, I, I don't think that you'd probably have that many people complain, you know. Yeah, that, and, you, if, and, you need to, and you need to think about it this way as well. Like our retail price on our cover is twenty seven ninety nine. And if you went to buy a replacement cover for your Jiffy or Strike Master, that you'd end up having to replace those broken cords every couple of years or every yeah. year. Uh, and they're 6 or $8 a piece. Um, and that replacement cover from Strike Master or Jiffy's 18 or $19 retail. Uh, and ours is guaranteed for life. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't take long replacing straps, and then you still have to deal with getting your hands down by the blades. Yep. Do you have any clue how many toothpicks are out out in existence? I mean, you know, it, um, it seems like well, in the last few years, every single fisherman you see, they either have one in their boat, you know, down by their pliers or, or everything else. 
I mean, when you're walking, I out, have a rough idea. <laughs> it, it's a lot. Uh, I I don't. I probably wouldn't say that during the podcast. How many I know there is? Oh, that's fair. But, uh, <laughs> no, that's it's, fair it's, enough. Yeah, it's probably not. It's it's not. It's not in six digits by by any means, but it's you know it's well into the tens of thousands of them. Right now, do you get a certain sense of pride when when you know you go to a new body of water? You're walking out there and you look over at somebody and they got a toothpick hanging from their jacket and or 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 you see one of your auger covers. They have no clue who you are. You know you don't know who they are. I mean, is is it just kind of cool? Like yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You know and. Uh, seeing it on TV, hanging on somebody's right, jacket yeah. on a Saturday or Sunday morning uh, show on uh, on TV, you know, you're watching. Yeah, that's a great, great feeling, you know. And I, and also, you know, I've been fishing plenty of times where I'm walking off the ice and I see somebody's catching a few fish and they don't have one. I'll just unclip it from my jacket and hand it to them as I walk by and say, here, try this. Yeah, so, that's, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's I've walked up to a lot of people who had our covers and introduced myself, and have met you know a lot of a lot of friends that way, a lot of people that you know that I would have never met before. So it's been it's been really fun. You bet. Now you guys have a new headquarters, right, for Cold Snap? Yeah, exactly. You know, for years we we managed to run operations out of uh, a great big uh, farm shop, basically. And uh, the back room at my mom's and dad's house, and uh, the basement of their house, and uh, Bruce Paulson's uh, four-stall garage, and you know, a couple other people's living rooms are putting things together. And you know, it just got to be too much. I mean, there was too much, too much volume of parts. There's too much running back and forth. I need this. I need this. So I have to drive into town and get this from Bruce. And so it just, we had a chance at buying this building and the price was right and the time was right. So we uh, snapped it up and remodeled it and, and the efficiency has been great. I mean, it's, it's, we're able to get product out the door so much faster and, and we're, we're more prepared this season than ever before by a factor of 10. Uh, we, you know, and we continually are adding, um, you know, different processes in to be more efficient and and uh, to track inventory better. And so that's really where we're at now is fine tuning all the processes so that in the next four or five years, I, you know, where do I see this being? I literally think that we'll be four to five times bigger in annual sales than we are now. And if we're at that point, we're going to need some, you know, serious. Um, inventory control and things like that. So those are all things that we're, you know, really working on now in the off season to get uh, geared up for, so we're prepared you know, when when we're four or five times bigger in a couple of years. And that's over in Glenville, Minnesota, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yep, just south of Albert Lee, about five miles. And you know, and one thing that surprised me is how many people will come to see the shop and and uh, buy product direct from us. You know, they'll, they'll drive for forty five minutes or an hour just to swing down. So yeah, we don't really have you know steady uh, normal nine to five hours. So if anybody you know would like to just check ahead and make sure somebody's going to be there. Uh, but we're more than happy to give them a tour of the shop and and. Um, they can buy product right direct without paying any shipping. You bet. Now, now you also have a new bait out, uh, the Craig EXL, and we had Craig Oiler on here, uh, I don't know, heck, that was probably already two months ago, and uh, he had kind of talked about how Scott Brower and, and uh, you and him all got together and designed that up. Uh, how, how has that been, you know, is that an avenue that you uh, see yourself pursuing more in debates? Yeah, yeah, we've sold quite a few of those, you know, and it's surprising we haven't sold more. Um, That's probably because you because got Craig's uh, picture on the package. <laughs> yeah, that kind of scares people off. Uh, I hope you get that. Uh, and that, that goes again to, you know, like the Todd Todd, uh, we called the toothpick the P2, and this is um, Scott Brower named this the Craigie because it was, it was brought to him by Craig. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the coolest thing about this is is that it was named one of the top ten best ice fishing lures of all time by um, Field and Stream. I oh. remember seeing that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, which, you know, for a 
relatively new lure. Yeah. I mean, the Craigie itself has been out uh, for the regular small size one has been out for, I don't know, five years maybe. But the large one has only been out for a couple years. So for that thing to be named one of the best all-time ice lures, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's just it just shows that you drop that in front of a, a fish and it, it, they just inhale it. I caught, um, I caught my only lake trout on it. Yeah, I, you know, trout especially. I will, Any type of trout um, inhale that thing. I've had guys uh, go fish trout in Minnesota through the ice, and they were skeptical, but I sent them a couple of them to try, and they said that that thing was way better than any live bait they had. And they, they caught fish, trout, and rainbows on those better than anything else that they tried. Very cool. Now, yep. what other products does uh, Cold Snap offer? You know, obviously we've talked about the the toothpick, the auger covers, the craggy. What else are you? Uh, what else do you offer? Well, we have uh, our, our Cold Snap rod clamps too. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they yep. they clip on the poles of your your portable uh, fish house, and we have them for um, Fravo clam. You know, just about any of the popular fish houses out there with the round poles. Uh, they'll snap on there and hold your fishing pole um, so that you can eat a sandwich or use it for a dead stick holder. And the best thing about them, unlike most of the other rod holders on the market, clip to the tub or uh, and then they're in the way and you hit them with your knee, you can put these up at eye level or shoulder level or wherever, put them up above your head and they'll hold a little flashlight. You know, just they're just super convenient, very small, super durable and um they just up out of the way so people once they try them they they just love them and won't go and uh they won't even use the other ones anymore very cool uh, you also i noticed on your website you are selling four-wheeler accessories plows uh stuff like that is that stuff that that you own or are you just selling that for somebody else or no that's it's an interesting story one of our pro staff guys uh chad moans uh, his family owns that company. Okay, Eagle and, is that uh, what it's called? Yeah, Eagle Eagle Plows, uh, Eagle ATV products. They uh, have winches, um, plows for ATVs and UTVs. They make a really cool basket for uh, for ATVs and a front basket and a rear basket that's unlike anything on the market. Um, you've seen all seen the baskets that people use for ice fishing. They're made out of expanded steel, right? Right. And it's basically like a cheese grater. So all of your gear slides around on that and gets scratched up. Well, this has actually laser cut slots in it. Uh, with, you know, that's all smooth. So it's, there's no scratching of your gear and it's all powder coated. It's not painted. So it's a lot more durable. It's a lot, uh, it's made with minimal welds so that there isn't going to be so many issues with rusting. And it's, all, like I said, all powder coated and laser cut holes. It's really a premium, premium uh, basket that goes on the front or the rear of your ATV that is like, unlike, there's nothing else like it on the market, not even close. Cool. But they're really, you know. Now, you also have a new product coming out. Uh, you're not going to spill the beans today, but... Can you give the listeners uh, any sort of hint, uh, you know, hint at it or, or when it's going to be coming out? Well, I, I, I'll spill partial beans on the covers. Uh, we're coming out with four different uh, auger covers besides the pistol bit that we mentioned. And um, so they're all going to be 10-inch covers. And the other thing that we have in the works and uh, is a go at this point for sure I'm not able to talk about it all until probably the end of October when we get them all in. And um, it's going to be a premium product and a whole new line for Cold Snap that uh, we haven't had before. So it's going to be really exciting. The price point is going to knock people's socks off, and it's going to be a must-have uh, for, the, for the next uh, several winters in a row uh, when we start rolling those out. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's... We're looking forward to hearing what the announcement is and what it's going to be. I mean, it's pretty exciting to see new things coming out in the ice fishing industry and in the fishing industry alone. Now you're going yeah, to be... it's going to it's going to be great. I mean, it's really something that we we took a lot of time and and thought went into it and design and um, yeah, it's 
I, I'm super excited about it, but I would love to say something about it, but I don't like to get the cart in front of the horse. Right. Absolutely. You're going to be unveiling those at the, uh, at the Ice Institute up in Sioux Falls? Yeah, our intent is to have those by the Ice Institute for the Dakota Angler Ice Institute in Sioux Falls. Um, I'll also be at Sands Bait and Tackle the week prior to that on November 2nd, I believe. And if I have them, I'll bring them there, and I'll make the announcement online prior to that um, on our Facebook page. So if you haven't already liked our Facebook page, uh, that's where I'll make the announcement Um and I'm sure you'll hear about it because I'll be uh, make sure that it gets out there. Oh, yeah, for sure. Very cool. Yeah. Now, to go away from Cold Snap, uh, one of the things when I was uh, digging up information on you before we did the interview, you know, I, I kind of always do a little bit of research on each person. Uh, you were quite a decorated trap shooter back in the day. Yeah, I, uh, junior, when I was, a uh, you know, in, in high school and, and, and middle school, I shot trap for a number of years with my family. Yeah, and that was it. Was a lot of fun. I spent a lot of weekends on the road with my dad and brothers and mom. And, and um, yeah, it's actually I think it was nineteen nineteen eighty five, which probably dates me a little bit. But I was the uh, junior champion of champions in the state of Minnesota. Wow, very cool. You probably yeah. you it probably you wish that they would have had the high school trap shooting back then, like they like the growing popularity for it is now. You know, they did, and it was real popular then, too, but not to the extent it is now. And that's, right. you know, and I think of Minnesota as being sort of a, um, you know, a progressive state and not someplace where you think that shooting sports would take off. And uh, and it really has. And I'm, I'd applaud the people, uh, you know, the coaches and, and, and the state and the high school athletic commission. To, you know, they've done an awesome job of that. They get thousands and thousands of kids to shoot every year you know that could be introduced to the shooting sports that would have never uh have been if it weren't for high school uh, high schools having the program awesome very cool now yeah. b before we let you go dan uh you could give us uh uh you know your social media handles uh website you know any place where our listeners can uh, go and check out cold snap for themselves Sure. If you go to our website, there's going to be links to all our social media places. So if you go to coldsnapoutdoors.com, you can go there. Um, if you're looking for any ATV, UTV products, like maybe a mount for your uh, snowplow and because you switched and got a different UTV now, um, you can go search by make, model, and year all on our website. And it's I think it's the only place online where you can buy Eagle products and do a make, model search for it. Uh, so that's cool, and you can go on to another tab and, and, and browse all the different products that we have from Cold Snap. We're also selling, going to be introducing a couple different rod cases this year too that we're basically selling through another source, but uh, we didn't design them, but that I I like and approve of that uh, you know that we've used for a number of years. Um, and then of course Instagram, we're on Instagram as Cold Snap Outdoors. Um, you know, as the season picks up, we like to, if people tag us in posts, we repost those and, and, you know, maybe you'll show up on a cold snap catalog at some point in time. Um, so, um, we don't really have much on Twitter, but we do have a Twitter account. Uh, usually repost a lot of our Instagram or Facebook posts, but, uh, occasionally I'll add some individual stuff on there as well. But, uh, yeah, we, we love the social media aspect, uh. So many of our pro staff members, you know, are, are active there too. So any of those that if you were getting involved in, in the Facebook page, uh, you're going to find the, the all the latest information and in Instagram as well. Very cool. Well, Dan, uh, we definitely appreciate you uh, calling in and uh, us getting to talk to you, and we cannot wait for the, uh, the unveiling of them products uh, later in October. Yeah, and uh, if you guys want to, call back and we could do a reveal for, on that too if you'd like so oh for sure yeah i think we're game with that so all right, all right. well well thank you very much have a good night gentlemen yeah you, you too. too see ya see ya. And there he goes dan hogue uh, nice having him on the podcast tonight that was a great interview very cool you know i we've had a lot of guides and and we've had a lot of tournament anglers it was really cool to to get a different uh Kind of the Style business of fishermen. aspect yeah, yeah. of it, you know, you know, kind of the behind the scenes of what goes into 
just the thought of a product. I mean, well, a lot of us use those things, but we never take the time to think of, man, somebody had to stop and like come up with this idea. And how did they come up with this idea and the story behind the equipment we use? So that's pretty neat to know. Right. And, and the other thing that I think is really cool, you know, we can, we can sit here and talk to a guide who's in Northern Minnesota, you know, central South Dakota, whatever. And, you know, somebody in, in a different state, six hours away, you know, maybe they've been there fishing one time, but they can't really relate, you know, as much. Everybody, you know, everybody knows the toothpick, right? You know, in anyone could, you know, go out and buy this cover. I think it's available at Shields. It's obviously Most, available, yeah. you know, uh, online and whatever. You but, go to any of the fishing shows they're usually a booth there and they have all those products for sale there yep that's that's really the cool part but but that 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 toothpick is i mean it's it for managing fish and getting them released healthy back into the water that thing can it it helps you out i mean if you haven't if you don't have one i highly suggest going out there they're like nine bucks ten bucks i mean they're definitely worth having yeah they might not even be that much right? i don't maybe not maybe they're like five bucks or something yeah, i mean they're for the price nine or something for the price you should have one right the other thing you know like i notice sometimes uh you know out bluegill fishing they'll get one real deep in their throat and and you know little tiny bluegill's mouth you know my thumbs and my fingers right. aren't fitting in there you just slide because because they got an, an xl version and then they got a smaller version if you've got that smaller panfish version i mean you can just stick that bugger right on in there do a little twist and boom she's right. out and, and that bluegill swimming you never heard it and and that's the coolest part and for the people that don't know what the toothpick is it's a hook removal tool for you know unhooking your hook out of a fish's mouth right yeah i guess uh that is something that maybe I should have clarified earlier to to the people that don't know because there are there obviously are people that don't know. Right. But whatever. Yeah. Now, well, back back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show about that that first win for you. Got it. That oh, first man. win. How did it How did it feel when you went up there and you know they said they read off your weight and then you started hearing some of the other coinglers start talking about their weights and you know. When, had, when did you know, like, I really legitly could win this thing? Well, uh, honestly, I, I figured there was going to be somebody that came in and, and uh, you know, had, had a weight that ended up beating mine out. Uh, even even there at the end, you know, me and you hadn't sat around for the whole entire time to uh, uh, see, other see, people see in. who had all weighed in. So I, I've got to admit, I... Basically, until the point when they read off the second place uh, right. person, you know, it's like, holy moly, this this really happened. This actually happened. And, man, I, I got to thank you. You know, I, I put out a Facebook post that, you know, probably was a Facebook post similar to somebody who had won the Bassmaster Classic. And, you know, this is just a club derby. But, you know, it's it my first year bass fishing. You know, uh, honest to goodness, like, God, a year ago, I barely knew what a Texas rig was. You know, I didn't know how to drop shot. You know, that was all foreign to me. And, and uh, you know, you've really just taken me under your wing and, and had the patience with me to show me how to do it. And, God, I just love it. I, can't, I can't even get enough of it. I just I think about it all day. I, I listen to Bass Talk Live. If I'm not <laughs> listening to Bass Talk Live, I'm listening to, you know, Bass Master Podcast. I, I don't know. It's just a lot of fun. There's so many ways that you can catch them. I think that's what I like about bass so much is there are, I mean, it's just so many ways you can go after them and you can get them. And not only, like, a big fish or just small fish like oh you only use this pattern it's probably going to catch small fish i mean you can catch on anything it, it's it, it really is a good time and and sometimes that's a common misconception for bass fishing some people think oh they're easy to catch there's days when i mean look there's professional tournaments where guys go out there and just flat blank yep. so i mean they're still tough i mean you still got to read the conditions like all fishing and uh just know where they like to be and it is it, when it happens and it all comes together it's it's a great feeling well what i thought was really kind of cool was uh you know we took off from the triggs boat ramp uh i think that's on upper gar yep. east okaboji right by the bridge right there by the bridge. and uh it was a mega bucks tournament which which uh for those of you listening that don't know uh what we had to do was uh matt drew a piece of paper and it said that uh, from seven to nine, we had to be on East Okaboji. From 
9 to 11, we had to be on one of the smaller lakes, which would be Upper Gar, Lower Gar, or Minnewashta. And then from 11 to 1, one. we had to be on West Lake Okaboji. 1 to 3, we could go wherever we wanted. Right. And so we drew uh, East Okaboji first. Me and Matt blasted off, and, and we're off and running. And Matt had an idea that we were going to go and drop shot for smallmouth. Yeah, this I knew there was a spot where I was expecting smallmouth were going to be in that spot, and uh, you did catch one smallmouth there, and you know we were getting a lot of like panfish that were biting it and stuff. So there was fish in the area, and kind of knew that oh, if the bait fish are there, maybe maybe the ones are there. And uh, you just did something a little different again, and you know just casted a little somewhere where we weren't expecting fish to be, and you hooked into one and that's that's such a huge thing is you just got to let the fish talk to you sometimes it's it's not just okay some guys i think get so focused on this is where the fish are supposed to be and have to be so this is where i'm going to fish sometimes you know what just fire a cast just like you know what i'm just going to randomly throw over here and all of a sudden it's like boom something happens and you know that it just kind of clicks in your brain like okay this is where they might be so then you start fishing and then pretty soon you catch a couple doing it and now you're on a pattern we we wore them out in that spot two hours straight and and we both filled the box on it that was, spot i was thinking about that we we uh neither one of us had a keeper in the boat at like what was it we took off at seven neither of us had a keeper in the boat until probably about seven twenty seven thirty almost probably about seven thirty and when you finally caught that smallmouth that barely kept for you right and by eight o'clock we were calling yeah <laughs> i mean so in a half an hour i mean it was it was happen. it happened fast i mean we were in that bite window um and it, yeah it, it seemed like i'd have one on and we'd net it you'd get back to fishing and as soon as i got that one in the live well all of a sudden you'd be like oh i'm hooked up you know and we fished clean we didn't lose any fish doing that uh yeah it was it was fun and and we weren't actually really throwing the same thing neither. No, I mean, no, we were throwing different things, and then and then after we got both of us had a limit in the boat, I switched to something else that you know trying to more of a big fish pattern to try to catch, and I ended up catching my biggest one of the day doing that. So I mean that's that's something that always goes through a person's mind too. You know, people might think, well, you're catching fish throwing this. Why are you going to throw something different? It's like okay, well yeah, but now I the fish are in the area now. I want to try to catch a bigger fish to call some of these smaller ones out so i'm gonna pick something up something else up that's a little bit bigger you know just something to get that bigger bite now you got second right yeah i got yep. second in the voter division i got i got first you got second and the other tournament that me and you both really had success i got second, second. you got first right but both of those times we caught a limit early and we were both culling early yep and I just felt such a different, you know, I mean, the weight was lifted off our shoulders. You know, if we're well, blasting off at 7, you know, by 8, 8.30, you know, we, we're all, you know, now we're just kind of fun fishing, and, fishing. And, and hoping, you know, hey, if we catch a bigger one, it works. But right. either way, you know, we can hold our head up because we're both going to the weigh-ins with limits. And and next thing you know, I mean, we're calling up with big fish. I I, I got second place in, in the big bass contest, and you were nipping on my on my right. heels with two other fish. I mean, we had some nice frickin' whoppers. Right. And, and, yeah. and, you know, in your big fish, you know, I talked to you about it and I talked to a couple other people, is, you know, people are like, well, you guys, you're not in the same division, but, like, how does it feel to see, like, you catch that bigger fish than me? Like, what if I wanted it? And it's like, well, yeah, you want to catch a bigger fish, but in the scope of things, that big fish wouldn't have helped me win, whereas it helped you win. Right. You know, right. like... If I would have caught it, I mean, the guy that won, Mark Mormon, he won. He had 13 pounds, and I had 11 pounds. So I would have had to have, like, two or three of them that size to jump up that poundage. Whereas, you know, where that would have just bumped me up to maybe close to 12 pounds. Right. Where that one helped you, you know, get... A, I mean, it was like you, the one that you called out was like 2 point. Four, I think, as you said, you, yep. you threw a two point four back, and that one was four point five. So that's a two pound call right there for you. Where if, if you don't have that call, you're back down there at seven pounds. You right, know? right. So, I, I'm not even in the money if right. I don't. So that's why those fish are so important. And it was, I think, the crazy thing about it is, 
you didn't realize you had it. Like you didn't, you you, you knew you had a fish hit, but you were just kind of like, uh, maybe it's there. I don't know. I and thought it real, had gotten off, yeah. right? And then all of a sudden you're just like, oh no, 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 it's there because the fish hit and was swimming at the boat. And you know, people don't. A lot of people don't like realize that sometimes. And yeah, yeah, you, you got it up there, and we were like, oh, this is a good one. And yeah, when when I finally caught up to it, it was like, oh yeah, yep, he's there. That that's a good fish. And you picked it up, or you you got it with a net, and you're like, that's a really good like, fish. That's, that's a good one. I was yep. like, that's it was thick. I mean, I had some. It was probably as long as the three that I had in the box, but it was like that one. You can just you can just tell when a fish just has some girth to it, and that one definitely did. So I mean, that was so awesome and i mean a huge congratulations to you and like i said you you've kept with it you're always willing to learn you're asking questions i mean sometimes people feel like oh, i don't want to ask questions you know that no it's that's what we're out there to do i mean that's what a person has to do so yep no well like i said i mean it, it, i know you got second and i know you're happy you know anyone should be happy with second i'm super happy with my first place but uh yeah, you know, a lot of that credit does go to you, and I I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. That I mean, it, it's just your decision making. I just wherever you when you say, "Hey, let's go over here," like I don't even question it. It's like, yep, that's where we need to be. I, I don't know. It just I I feel that that's one of the things that really separates anglers, and you hear that all the time. You know, the decision making, and I think you've got it. You know, some people they can catch a fish, and they're willing to sit there and beat that spot for thirty minutes because they caught a fish. I mean, especially and, in a tournament. And I do I mean, that sometimes, though, to a fault. There's there's times where I do that. Like, you know, I've been told before when Emily and I have been out fishing, and she's just like, are we going to try something different or not? Sometimes you just sit here and just keep going and keep going. You, are we going to move spots or something? So yeah. there's a piece of me that – but that's like her saying that it, sometimes when I'm, we're out fishing in a tournament is in the back of my head like – Okay, you know you're you're on a time you're on a time clock here. You, you can't just sit here and try to hope they. You got to go try to find some fish that are biting. Yep. Yeah, and, and the problem with the bass tournament is you got to go and find bass. You know. Right. I mean, we were wearing out the northerns. <laughs> oh man, it's another northern. Yeah. Another northern. Oh, and and that one when we were on east and we were flipping docks. Yeah. And I I tossed a, a chatterbait <laughs> up there. And obviously, in that type of spot, I was not expecting to tangle with a northern. And, and I set the hook, and it's like, oh, baby, this is a good one here. And then, yeah, you, you said right away, yeah, it's a northern. Yeah, yeah boy. We each caught a silver yeah. northern. Those are always cool, cool to see. That was my first one ever. Yeah, that's, I, those are always neat to You know, see you said, yeah, different. you want to take a picture with it? Nah, I dumped it over, and, and I've kind of thought about it a few times since, like, you know, I mean, it it wasn't big. I mean, maybe it was 25 inches or something like that. But, right. I mean, just the fact that it was a silver, I, I should have gotten a picture with it. But, oh, well, that's that's the way it goes. <laughs> no, huge congratulations to you. And we got two more left. It's, a, it's such a great club to be a part of. Oh, I, I mean, I love it. guys were talking to us afterwards, you know, that I mean, sat around in the parking lot, you know, just shooting the breeze with people. It, yep. it, it's just such a – if you're looking for – you know, you want to get involved with a fishing club like that, get into tournament bass fishing. You can just show up at, we've talked about it on here before, you can come down to the landing before blast off and pay your entry fee, play, pay the club fee, and you can get in as non-boater. As long as, you know, there's more boaters than there is non-boaters or it's an even number, you can just draw a number and you just get randomly placed with a guy that doesn't have a non-boater with them so yep and that's iowa great lakes bass club uh if, if you're looking for it on facebook just and i imagine you could send them a private message and get a hold of who you need there but yeah a lot of fun yep well that there is episode 41 thanks for tuning in we'll see you next week on 42 peace